Explicit content is found in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. Some of the most infamous crimes have happened in Cleveland, Ohio. In the 1930s, the city was marked by lawlessness as bootleggers ran alcohol during the time of Prohibition. Much like the illegal drug trade today, bootleggers would often resort to violence to make sure they stayed in business. Eventually, they would become more sophisticated, and this gave way to an intricate system of organized crime in the city. Organized crime in Cleveland was not limited to just the criminals. They had their tendrils in every law and public office in the city. But soon, Clevelanders would have more to fear than just organized crime. Okay, on to the show. Cleveland Mayor Harold Burton won his seat by running on a campaign built on promises of reform and reduction of crime. One of the first things he did after he was sworn in was prove to Cleveland just how serious he was about his promises. He brought in the infamous Elliot Ness as Cleveland's new director of public safety. Ness had made his name by bringing down organized crime, specifically Al Capone, in Chicago. Ness was ready to tackle the crime problem in Cleveland. However, nothing could have prepared him for a cruel and intelligent serial killer that turned the Cleveland neighborhood of Kingsbury Run into his personal playground. Some called him the Cleveland Torso Murderer, others the Headhunter. We will call him the Mad Butcher of Cleveland. Our story may or may not begin in the late summer of 1934. Joseph Hedjuk was walking along the shore of Lake Erie when he came upon something startling. He found a broken rib cage and spinal column that he feared would be human. He called Deputy Sheriff Melvin Keener to come look. The Deputy Sheriff looked at the bones, deemed them to be animal, and told Joseph to bury them. Despite the nagging feeling that what he found wasn't animal bones, Joseph buried them. On September 5, 1934, Frank Legassi was searching the beach for driftwood about 30 miles away from where Joseph had been two weeks before. Frank got his own shocking discovery in the lower half of a woman's torso he found sticking out of the sand. He called police, and they speculated that the woman probably committed suicide by drowning in the lake. The state of her body was due to a boat's propeller ripping it apart. Coroner Arthur Pierce quickly ruled out this theory. Coroner Pierce, after examining the body, deduced it was cut with clean precision and not by a boat's propeller. He also determined that the body had been in the lake for about four months, and the woman had been dead for about six months. The body had been soaked in some kind of chemical that turned the skin red and leathery. The coroner later determined that the chemical was either calcium hypochloride or chloride of lime. The press caught wind of this intriguing story and named the woman the Lady of the Lake. Joseph heard the story and thought back to the bones he buried a couple weeks before. He told authorities, and they were able to dig up what was buried. They would continue to search the area for more body parts. Despite thoroughly searching the lake and beach, authorities were only able to find one other body part, a section of her upper arm. It's no wonder the search was near fruitless. Lake Erie is over 25 square kilometers, or 15 and a half square miles large. Just over a week after the torso was found, it was buried along with the bones Joseph found, as well as the section of the upper arm at Highland Park Cemetery. The Lady of the Lake, like many of the Mad Butcher's victims, remains unidentified to this day. There are many similarities to the Lady of the Lake and later victims, but some argue that she is not one of the Mad Butcher's victims. Many researchers refer to her as Victim Zero. Whether she is a true victim of the Mad Butcher or not, her grisly murder would foreshadow a horror that would grip Cleveland for many years to come. Kingsbury Run is a part of Cleveland that you would leave off the tourist itinerary. The neighborhood was marked with run-down homes and homeless communities. 
The poorest and most overlooked residents of Cleveland live in Kingsbury Run. A set of railroad tracks ran along the side of the neighborhood, so often you would find a large population of vagrants or people passing through in order to find economic opportunities out west. It was here, at a location called Jackass Hill, that the Mad Butcher dumps his first two official victims. September 23, 1935, was the first day of fall. 16-year-old James Wagner and 12-year-old Peter Costura were racing each other down Jackass Hill. James reached the bottom first, and as he turned around to watch Peter, he noticed something strange in the knee-high brush. He took a couple of steps closer to get a good look. What he saw made him freeze, then turn around and run towards his friend. His eyes were wide as he shouted, There's a dead man down there with no head! The boys ran until they found a man and told him to call the police. Sergeant Arthur Marsh and Patrolman Arthur Stitt of the Erie Railroad Police were the first to arrive at the scene. What they found was the body of a young white male who was nude except for a pair of black socks. He was missing his head, as well as his penis. The two men decided to split up and comb the area for the missing body parts. It didn't take long for Patrolman Stitt to call over Sergeant Marsh. However, it wasn't the man's head that Stitt found. It was another body. The second body was that of an older white male. He too had been decapitated and emasculated. While this body was more decomposed than the first one, it also had the same red tinge indicative of it being exposed to chemicals. City police now began to file in. The first detectives were Detectives Emile Musil and Orly May. They were only a few blocks away when they got the call. Detective May immediately surmised that the victims were killed elsewhere, as there was little blood at the crime scene. The bodies were also posed arms tucked in, and legs and heels together. Police found the men's genitalia about 20 feet away. They also, after noticing some hair sticking out of the ground, found both heads buried nearby. Dr. Arthur Pierce, Cleveland's coroner, was the one to perform the autopsies on the two bodies. While examining the second body, that of the older man, Dr. Pierce found it difficult to pin down the exact time of death as the treatment of the body with chemicals acted as a preservative. Dr. Pierce guessed that he had been dead for about one to two weeks. The chemicals also made identifying the body with fingerprints impossible. What he could surmise was that the man was about 45 years old, stood 5 feet 6 inches tall, had brown eyes and hair, and had perfect teeth. He was never identified. The corpse of the younger man had not been dead as long as the older man, maybe only one or two days. He stood 5 feet 10 and weighed about 150 pounds. Dr. Pierce noticed that the head had been removed skillfully between the third and fourth cervical vertebrae. He also noted that the decapitation was the cause of death for the younger man. He guessed it was the same for the older man, but could not be certain. Dr. Pierce got fingerprints from the body, he was eventually identified as Edward A. Andresi. Cleveland police knew 28-year-old Edward Andresi. He lived near the west side of Cleveland with his parents and brother, but would often spend time in Kingsbury Run. There, Edward had gained the reputation as kind of a punk. Police picked him up for drunk and disorderlies, bar fights, and backroom gambling. Edward's parents were the ones to identify him at the morgue. Afterwards, they told police their son was a good man. He just ran with the wrong crowd. The last time they saw him was on the night of September 19th when Edward left the house without saying a word as to where he was going. Police felt that Edward's lifestyle was what led to his death. As they learned more about him, the more this seemed likely. Edward was the father of a young son he did not attempt to see. He didn't work so much as he dedicated his life to drinking and fighting. And if he wasn't doing those things, the rumor was that he had an active sex life and was not too picky about the gender of his partner. This singular focus on Edward's sex life caused detectives to have tunnel vision. 
They became convinced that Edward's death, as well as the man found with him, was due to a homosexual love triangle gone wrong. With the amount of organized crime happening in the city, it was easy for this strange double murder to temporarily fall on the wayside. When Cleveland elected Harold Burton as mayor, he followed through on his promise of criminal reform in the city. Not only were there bootleggers and organized crime, but also it was well known that the police and city officials were corrupt. He needed to fill the director of public safety position with someone who would be as dedicated to cleaning up Cleveland as the mayor was. Mayor Burton interviewed many candidates, but the clear standout was Elliot Ness. Right after interviewing him on December 11, 1935, Mayor Burton swore in Ness as Cleveland's new director of public safety. Elliot Ness was born on April 19, 1903, to Peter Ness and Emma King. Peter was a baker who immigrated from Norway in 1881. Emma was the daughter of a British engineer father and Norwegian mother. Ness had three older sisters. His parents described him as an exceptional child who his big sisters adored. Ness was a typical child in most ways. From his adolescence, he proved to be a hard worker as he worked a paper route and helped in his father's bakery. While active during the day, at night, Ness could be found reading Sherlock Holmes novels. After graduating from Finger High School, Ness went to the University of Chicago to study commerce, law, and political science. Ness graduated in 1925. Instead of choosing a lucrative job in business, Ness chose a poorly paid job as an investigator with the retail credit company. At night, he studied at a graduate program with famed criminologist August Vollmer. In 1927, he passed the civil service test and was able to join the Treasury Department as a special agent. After a few months, he was transferred to the Justice Department and assigned to the Prohibition Bureau. It was here that Ness would make a name for himself by taking down Al Capone and his cronies in Chicago. Al Capone was seen as untouchable. But that didn't matter to young Ness. His dogged hard work paid off after Capone was sent to jail for tax fraud. Elliot Ness was a perfect candidate for cleaning up the streets of Cleveland. It was the Mad Butcher, however, that would prove to be Ness's toughest assignment. Less than six months after the discovery of Edward Andersi and the Unidentified Man, on January 25, 1936, a woman saw a dog sniffing at a basket. Curious, she looked into the basket and saw what she determined to be hams. However, Charles Page, the local butcher, also looked at the baskets and determined those were definitely not hams, but body parts. He called the police. When they arrived, they opened the baskets to find half a female headless torso wrapped in newspaper. A young mechanic found the rest of the body a few weeks later in a vacant lot, but police never recovered her head. This, disturbingly, would become a trend amongst victims of the Mad Butcher. Coroner Pierce conducted the autopsy and determined the woman had been dead for at least two days. He noted she had contracted neck muscles, indicating that decapitation either was the cause of death or happened shortly after death. The decapitation and bisection of the torso was clean and made in between the bones of her spine. Fingerprints identified victim three as Florence Polio. Florence, much like Edward Andersi, lived a fast lifestyle that centered around Kingsbury Run. Residents in the area were familiar with her, but no one seemed to know anything about her. Police were also familiar with her, as she was a sex worker who often sold illegal liquor. She had been twice married and twice divorced. Witnesses said they would often see her with different men. These men would have been good suspects if anyone knew who they were. She also had different aliases. She was Flo Davis at the apartment she lived. 
Despite the similarities between Florence and the two bodies discovered in September, Detective Sergeant James Hogan refused to acknowledge that the same man might have carried them out. He said the investigative team would consider this a completely separate homicide. Despite the disturbing murders taking place, the city of Cleveland was excited to be hosting the Republican National Convention during the first week of June 1936. Mayor Burton put Director Ness in charge of making sure the convention went off without a hitch. Ness took this charge seriously and made sure his men were ready to protect delegates while they were in the city. He was also adamant that there would be no violent protests during this time and did everything in his power to ensure that. Some delegates arrived at Cleveland the Friday before the convention to take in the city. Their experience of Cleveland included the stunning public square and awe-inspiring Terminal Tower and avoided the shanty towns and polluted rivers. The mysterious torso murders were hidden from the delegates, but a reminder of the serial killer would soon hit the city again. In June 1936, two boys taking a shortcut through Kingsbury Run to go fishing happened upon what looked like a pair of pants rolled up and hidden under a bush. Upon closer examination, made by poking their discovery with a stick, the boys realized they were looking at a severed head. Terrified, they ran to the oldest boy's home and told his mother. She called the police. Police found the head immediately. It wouldn't be until the next morning that they would find the rest of the body. The killer hid the body in sumac bushes just outside the Nickel Plate Police Office. The Nickel Plate Police were the railroad police, which led authorities to believe the killer was sending a message. You can't keep everyone safe. The body was that of a young man in his mid-twenties. He was tall, slender, and clean-shaven. The clothes found near the body were blood-stained, but also nearly new and expensive. A pair of underwear nearby had the laundry mark J.D. This victim seemed to be living a much easier life than the previous victims. Investigators were hopeful in identifying the victim as he had numerous tattoos. His tattoos included a cupid and an anchor, which indicated he might have been a sailor. He also had a dove with the words Helen Paul, which may have been his parents, siblings, or children's names. There was a butterfly as well as Jiggs, a popular cartoon character at the time. He also had an arrow piercing a heart with a few flags. Lastly, there were the letters WCG. These initials were different from the initials in the underwear, which confused investigators. Investigators were desperate for an identity. They needed a way for a large number of people to see the victim they called the tattooed man in hopes that one could recognize him. They found the perfect opportunity in the Great Lakes Expo of 1936. Thousands of visitors would come to the Expo to see a variety of attractions it offered. Amongst the ethnic shops and exotic displays stood a glass case containing a head. It was a replica of the tattooed man's death mask. It even had natural-looking hair to complete the look. A sign informed the public who the tattooed man was and gave a detailed description of his tattoos. Despite thousands of people looking at his face and reading his story, the tattooed man was never identified. Like the other victims, the tattooed man was decapitated, undressed, cleaned, and drained of his blood. This convinced Coroner Pierce that the same person had committed all four murders. The lack of connection between the victims led him to believe the killer was choosing his victims randomly. While Ness was busy overseeing events such as the Republican National Convention and taking down organized crime, Detective Hogan found himself at a standstill with the puzzling decapitation murders. Unable to identify half of the victims forced Detective Hogan's investigation to a halt. It wouldn't be long until another body was found. A 17-year-old girl hiking in a wooded area next to Big Creek found victim 5. She was horrified to come upon the naked, headless, and badly decomposed male body. Dozens of the city's officers came to the scene. 
there was an abandoned hobo camp near the death site. Investigators believed that's where the mad butcher found his victim. Something that stood out to investigators was the amount of blood indicated victim 5 had been killed where he was found and not dumped like the other victims. Coroner Pierce determined victim 5 to have been dead for at least two months, probably longer. If Coroner Pierce was right, that would mean victim 5 had been killed before the tattooed man. The victim was a small man who stood about 5 foot 5 and weighed 145 pounds. His brown hair was balding on top but long on the sides, and his teeth were mostly in good condition. The only injury was a single knife wound that detached the head between the third and fourth cervical vertebrae. Decomposition of the body made fingerprinting impossible. Police would never identify victim 5. By this point, even the most stubborn of the Cleveland Police Department had to concede that there was a serial killer in their city. The discovery of victim 6 sent the city into hysterics. On September 10, 1936, a homeless man waiting for a train noticed a human torso floating in a stagnant pool. Like the others found before, the mad butcher bisected the torso of victim 6. Police rushed to the scene to search for the rest of the body. Police did not find more body parts, but they did find a bloody newspaper dated September 8th and bloody clothes nearby. Coroner Pierce ruled the man had been dead for about 48 hours. He was a white man, about 22 to 28 years old. He was 5 foot 9 or 10 and weighed about 150 pounds. The head had been removed between the third and fourth cervical vertebrae, and the trunk had been bisected between the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae. The killer had also removed the man's genitals. Because of the lack of identifiers, police were never able to identify victim six. And now, we'll pause for a word from our sponsors. The murder of victim six could not have come at a worse time for Ness. Another major convention would be coming to Cleveland, the American Legion Convention, and Ness was busy at work making sure security was flawless. His reputation depended on the convention going off without a hitch. However, he decided that he could no longer count on Detective Hogan to solve the torso murders. The media was ramping up coverage on the murders, and Ness didn't want to be known for any kind of failure. Therefore, he shifted his focus from the convention to solving the murders. Ness committed 25 detectives to the case full-time, the most ever assigned to a single case in Cleveland history. Detective Peter Merlow and his partner, Detective Martin Zalewski, would head the investigation. They focused on missing person reports as well as hitting the pavement at Kingsbury Run and talking to people to see if anyone knew anything. Ness also had a special hotline set up for people to call in tips about the murders. Seemingly promising leads would pop up, but nothing would lead detectives any closer to the mad butcher. Even though criminal profiling wouldn't be the norm for many decades, Ness innately understood that understanding the mad butcher would help them find him. Coroner Pierce believed the same thing, and he organized a special meeting made up of 34 individuals from all different parts of law enforcement. In this meeting, they would pick apart the minute details of the murders in order to create a profile for the mad butcher. Once police understood who they were looking for, they would stand a greater chance of finding him. The meeting was composed of several officers, Coroner Pierce, the county prosecutor, the county pathologist, the police department's ballistic department, as well as outside medical consultants. After hours of discussing the Mad Butcher and his crimes, the team came to seven conclusions. One, all six torso killings were the work of a single individual operating alone. Two, the killer, while obviously demented and psychotic, 
was not recognizably insane. While everyone could accept this conclusion, there was a deviation of opinion as to why the Mad Butcher cut up his victims. Some believe that the Mad Butcher received sexual gratification from cutting up his victims. Others, such as Coroner Pierce and Ness, believe that the Mad Butcher cut up his victims for more practical reasons, to obscure the identity as well as make them easier to transport. 3. The killer possessed a definite knowledge of human anatomy and some surgical skill, but he had not displayed evidence of any actual medical training. The disarticulation of the bodies indicated someone more like a butcher or hunter than that of a surgeon. 4. The killer was large and strong. The group came to this conclusion due to where some of the bodies were dumped as well as how much strength it takes to behead a human. 5. The killer probably lived in or near the 3rd Precinct or another area close to Kingsbury Run. 6. The killer probably kept a private workshop or laboratory in which he conducted his butchery. It was here that the mad butcher would disarticulate the bodies, drain their blood, and wash the bodies before he dumped them. 7. The killer preyed upon individuals of the lower class. History would show that serial killers often preyed upon those that society would not miss. The mad butcher was no different. Now that they had a profile, they needed a plan to catch the mad butcher before he killed again. Coroner Pierce suggested police going undercover as homeless and offering themselves up as bait. Even if they weren't attacked, they would be able to glean information they would not otherwise by becoming a part of the homeless community. When Cleveland residents read about this meeting in the paper, they felt better knowing the best minds the city had to offer were focused on finding the Mad Butcher. This meeting would be the last Coroner Pierce would work on the Torso murders. In November, he lost the election for Coroner to Samuel Gerber. Coroner Gerber's interest in psychology and criminology, as well as his forensic science skills, would prove to be a great asset to the investigation, even if he and Ness didn't always get along. The Mad Butcher granted a small reprieve before he struck again. On February 23, 1937, the upper half of a woman's torso washed up on the shores of Lake Erie in almost the exact same place where the Lady of the Lake's torso had been found. Investigators theorized the Mad Butcher dumped the body in the river in Kingsbury Run and then it made its way to Lake Erie. That theory gained validity when the bottom half of the torso was found two months later floating off East 37th Street. Coroner Gerber examined the body, noting the arms were cut cleanly at the shoulders. He also noted that decapitation was not the cause of death, but could not determine what did kill the woman. The torso had been in the water for about 48 hours, and the victim had been dead for about one to two days before she was dumped in the water. Examiners estimated she was in her mid twenties, was five foot five to five foot seven, and weighed about one hundred to one hundred and twenty pounds. She was a slight woman with a fair complexion and light brown hair. She had given birth at least once, maybe twice. From the condition of her lungs, Coroner Gerber felt certain that she had lived her entire life in an industrial city like Cleveland. Detectives tried to match the body to missing women in the area, but failed to find out who she was. Victim 7 remains unidentified. After examining the body of Victim 7, as well as poring over the details from the first six victims, Coroner Gerber submitted a five-page report to the homicide unit on his findings. He dismissed the Lady of the Lake as a mad butcher victim because there wasn't enough evidence to confirm her as a victim. He also went into detail about the type of dismemberment the Mad Butcher inflicted on each body, noting the similarities and differences. Coroner Gerber believed that the killer cut up the bodies 
in order to make them easier for transport and dumping. Coroner Gerber also noticed that the direction of the knife marks indicated that the killer was right-handed. Since there was little hacking or hesitation marks, the killer would have to be someone knowledgeable in anatomy. Coroner Gerber thought the suspect would most likely have to be a doctor or surgeon that kills when under the influence of a drug or alcohol-induced fury. He concluded that the motivation of the murders would be hard to ascertain, but he was sure the killer was not sexually motivated. This was in sharp contrast to almost every detective on the case. Some of this report made it into the newspaper, and this infuriated Ness. He was concerned that this would create another round of hysteria that would cause Clevelanders to call in with all their theories, valid or not. Ness was right. The phones blew up, causing the detectives to chase down every lead that came in. Coroner Gerber was unconcerned with Ness's feelings so long as he remained in the media spotlight. It would be a point of contention for the rest of their working relationship. On June 6, 1937, 14-year-old Russell Tower was watching the Coast Guard boat search for a drowning victim in the river. On his way home, Russell crossed underneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge when he came across a human skull. When police arrived, they found pieces of a skeleton in an old burlap sack. Also in the sack, was a page from the Plain Dealer, dated June 5, 1936. Twenty feet away from the sack was a cream-colored wool cap, fragments of a dress, and strands of black hair. Coroner Gerber estimated the remains were about a year old. If he was correct, this would mean the murder took place not long after the murder of the tattooed man. They found traces of lime, which would have hastened decomposition. The mad butcher expertly dismembered her like the other victims. The arms, legs, and one rib were missing, but the rest of the skeleton was there. Coroner Gerber was able to determine that the skeleton was that of a slight black woman, about 35 years old. She would have been no taller than five foot one, and weighed about 100 pounds. Police did not feel confident they would identify this body. However, the victim had very notable teeth that would make identification through dental records possible. Police checked with local dentists, and two weeks later, a Cincinnati dentist came forward to identify the woman as Rose Wallace. Despite this, police didn't feel confident in the identification. Detective Marlowe's investigation erased that skepticism. He learned that Rose had disappeared on August 21, 1936. She was about 40 years old and matched the same general description as the skeleton. She also lived in the 3rd District, a central location to the murders. Equally shocking was that Rose's life was eerily similar to Florence Polio's. Like Florence, Rose was a sex worker in the Kingsbury Run area. In fact, Rose and Florence lived close to each other and ran in the same circles, though there was no evidence the two women knew each other. Despite all this, Coroner Gerber refused to believe victim 8 was Rose Wallace. His reasoning was that she disappeared two months after he believed the victim died. He also did not feel confident in the dental identification. It later came out that many detectives and Elliot Ness himself, harbored doubts about the identity of victim 8. Detective Merlo was utterly convinced that he had the right identification, mainly because, after she disappeared, no one heard from Rose Wallace again. The city of Cleveland was on edge. Not only were they dealing with a slew of terrifying unsolved murders, but there was also a clash between local industrialists and union workers. The Congress of Industrial Organizers sanctioned a strike. Things got so bad that the mayor called in the National Guard to keep order. On July 6, 1937, a guardsman on strike duty saw a part of a mannequin floating in the water. Upon closer inspection, 
he realized it was not a mannequin, but a human body. Police found the thighs and lower torso of victim nine. Over the following week, more parts of the body were found in the river. Eventually, the entire body, except for the head, was recovered, albeit in pieces. Coroner Gerber determined the cause of death to be decapitation. He also determined the time of death to be a couple of days before the first body parts were found. Unlike the other victims, Victim 9's body showed a lot more hesitation marks than usual. He had also been disemboweled, a horrifying indication that the mad butcher was escalating. Police never found the organs. Victim 9 was a male aged between 35 and 40 years old. He would have stood 5 foot 8 and weighed 153 pounds. There was a scar on his right thumb. He also had a tattoo of a small blue cross on the calf of his left leg. Victim 9 was well nourished, in good physical condition, and had neatly groomed nails. All indicators that he was not a vagrant. Police ran his fingerprints, but there were no matches. Victim 9 has never been identified. By this time, police had a suspect. They were investigating doctors based on the theories put forth by Coroner Gerber. They looked at doctors, med students, and male nurses in the area. They were most interested in those that had a history of deviant behavior, use of drugs and alcohol, practice of homosexual behavior, or a fondness for illicit sexual behavior. Soon, Dr. Frank Sweeney emerged as their strongest suspect thus far. Dr. Sweeney was a tall, large man who was very strong. He grew up in the Kingsbury area and kept an office in the area during various parts in his career. He lost his surgical residency at St. Alexis Hospital and his marriage due to his alcoholism. There were also rumors that Dr. Sweeney engaged in homosexual behavior. He checked all the boxes for investigators. However, there were problems. Dr. Sweeney had an alibi for one of the killings. Also, there was no physical evidence tying him to any of the murders. But the biggest problem for police was Congressman Martin Sweeney, who was Dr. Sweeney's first cousin. Congressman Sweeney was a well-liked politician and held a lot of political influence. In March 1937, Congressman Sweeney tore into Mayor Burton and Elliot Ness, claiming that their dedication to ridding the city of corruption was a waste of tax dollars that could have gone to finding the Mad Butcher. Despite everything that stood in his way, Lieutenant Cowles continued to investigate Dr. Sweeney. His investigation took him to Sandusky, Ohio, a city a few hours' drive from Cleveland. Sandusky police had found a severed leg, and Lieutenant Cowles thought it may have something to do with the Mad Butcher. While the lead didn't pan out, it allowed Lieutenant Cowles the opportunity to try and poke holes in Dr. Sweeney's alibi. During one of the murders, Dr. Sweeney had checked himself into the Sandusky Soldiers and Sailors' home for treatment for his alcoholism. Lieutenant Cowles found out that the hospital was not on lockdown and that Dr. Sweeney could leave any time he wanted. Lieutenant Cowles felt certain that Dr. Sweeney could leave for a couple of days and no one would notice. This put his alibi into question. Lieutenant Cowles felt even more confident about his suspect when he met Alex Archaki. Alex was convinced that Dr. Sweeney was the mad butcher. Alex was a convicted burglar who became friends with Dr. Sweeney while Alex was serving time at the Ohio Penitentiary Honor Farm. The farm shared some common facilities with the Sandusky Soldiers and Sailors Home. Alex supplied Dr. Sweeney with alcohol, and they got to know each other very well. Alex told Lieutenant Cowles about the first time they met, before their time together in Sandusky. Dr. Sweeney found Alex drinking alone at a bar in Cleveland. He sat down next to him and struck up a conversation. They talked and drank together. 
Alex became uncomfortable by the fact that Dr. Sweeney kept steering the conversation by asking Alex personal questions about himself. He wanted to know where Alex lived, if he had family in Cleveland, and if he was married. At first, he thought Dr. Sweeney was hitting on him, but later he thought that Dr. Sweeney was sizing him up as a potential victim. Alex also talked about the many unexplained absences Dr. Sweeney had while in Sandusky. He believed those absences lined up with the murders that were happening in Cleveland. While this wasn't solid proof of Dr. Sweeney's guilt, it certainly moved him to the top of the suspect list. When he got back to Cleveland, Lieutenant Cowell set up a covert investigation into Dr. Sweeney. Lieutenant Cowles focused his investigation on Dr. Sweeney. He learned a lot while looking into Dr. Sweeney's background. He found a family history of psychosis and alcoholism. He also found out that Dr. Sweeney's wife filed for divorce in 1936 due to Dr. Sweeney's drinking. She sought sole custody of their children and asked for a restraining order against Dr. Sweeney. Lieutenant Cowles noticed that the separation happened around the same time the Lady of the Lake washed up on Lake Erie. The coincidence was too much to ignore. Almost enough time passed before the discovery of Victim 10 that the city of Cleveland could convince themselves the Mad Butcher was just a nightmare. However, the piece ended on April 8, 1938, when a woman's leg was fished out of the river. It was only the shin. The leg was cut at the knee and the ankle. The rest of the body, with the exception of the arms and head, were found in burlap sacks in the river. Examination of the body led Coroner Gerber to believe victim 10 was a woman who stood about 5 feet 3 and weighed about 120 pounds. She was between 25 and 30. She had given birth by C-section and either had another birth or an abortion, as indicated by a bilateral laceration on her cervix. There were no drugs in her system, and cause of death was most likely decapitation. Victim 10 was never identified. Coroner Gerber determined, much to the horror of Cleveland police, that the body was only three to five days old. No one wanted to believe the Mad Butcher was back in action, but the proof was right there in front of them. This discovery led to the disintegration of the professional relationship between Elliot Ness and Coroner Gerber. Ness felt that Coroner Gerber was relishing too much in the attention the media was giving him. Coroner Gerber felt that Ness was trying to bury the truth. It was August 16, 1938, that the Mad Butcher's last two victims were found. Three men found the dismembered remains of a woman while looking for scrap iron in an undeveloped field. The police station was not far from the site, and they arrived quickly. Police noticed that, while the limbs and head had been removed in the usual fashion, the torso had not been bisected. When the police found the victim's head a few feet away, they were optimistic that they could identify her. Police had cordoned off a large part of the area to continue their search for clues. Outside the cordoned off area, a crowd had gathered to watch the police. Todd Bartholomew stood to the east of the crime scene with his wife and a friend. They noticed an awful stench coming from a trash heap. When Todd investigated, he found what appeared to be human bones. He called over the nearest policeman, Sergeant William Miller. It took about an hour for investigators to recover about 40 bones. The crime scene was very similar to the first two victims, which served to further confuse everyone investigating the crime. After examining the first victim found, Coroner Gerber noted that the mad butcher had done some of his cleanest dismemberment with her. However, he noted that the Mad Butcher didn't disarticulate the body as much as he did in his previous victims, leading him to assume that the killer either was interrupted or became bored. Despite the good condition of the body, 
Coroner Gerber couldn't narrow down the time of death. He noted the body was hardened, like it had been kept in a refrigerator for some time. He estimated the body was about six months old. The victim was a healthy woman in her mid-thirties. She stood five feet four and weighed about 120 to 125 pounds. She had long, light brown hair, large feet, and small hands. Fingerprints taken were unable to produce a match. Police were also unable to identify the victim through dental records, despite the fact that she had very notable dental work. Unfortunately, she would be forever known as Victim 11. The skeletal remains proved to be a great challenge for Coroner Gerber and his team. They determined Victim 12 was a man who had been dead for seven to nine months. This would mean he was killed long before Victim 10. Victim 12 was a slight man. He stood about 5 feet 7 and weighed about 135 to 140 pounds. He was probably in his mid to late 30s. Coroner Gerber and his team agreed the victim was probably Caucasian. Victim 12 was never identified. The press raked nests over the coals after this latest set of bodies. Apparently, the bodies were dumped in an area that Ness could see outside his office window. Journalists, as well as some police, were certain that the mad butcher was taunting Ness. Ness heard the message loud and clear. Shortly after midnight, on August 24, 1938, Ness and 25 lawmen raided the shanty towns in Cleveland. Ness was certain he would find the mad butcher amongst the poorest in the city. They barreled into the community, not unlike how Ness would barrel into suspected breweries when he was in Chicago. After 30 minutes of kicking down doors, searching homes, and rounding people up, 38 residents were taken to Central Station. Ness still wasn't satisfied and pushed deeper into the neighborhood. He found another collection of shanty homes and raided those as well. Ness figured it was a good place to investigate, as the homes were located near where Victim 8 was found. Police took 10 more vagrants into custody. They also raided a hobo jungle close to where Victim 6 was found. 15 more vagrants were rounded up. By the end of the night, 63 men were questioned, fingerprinted, and locked away. 11 had criminal records and were handed over to the FBI. For the men that proved they were employed or had family, they were released. For the rest, they were submitted to relocation and rehabilitation by Ness, which meant they were sent to the workhouse. Police found no evidence of the Mad Butcher during their raid. On the orders of Ness, police burned the shanty towns to the ground. Ness's actions outraged Clevelanders. Even his most ardent supporters couldn't believe that he would commit such a raid and then have the gall to burn the shanty towns down. It was clear that Ness was taking out his frustrations on the weakest population in Cleveland, the very people already victimized by the Mad Butcher. It was an absolute PR nightmare for Ness. While Ness was convinced the Mad Butcher was a vagrant that could be found in a shanty town, Lieutenant Cowles was just as convinced that Dr. Sweeney was the true killer. After Ness's failed raid, Lieutenant Cowles ramped up his investigation into the doctor. Proving Dr. Sweeney's guilt was going to be difficult. Lieutenant Cowles had to tread carefully because of Dr. Sweeney's political connections. After tailing Dr. Sweeney for a time, which the doctor noticed immediately, Elliot Ness ordered police to pick up Dr. Sweeney for interrogation. On August 24, 1938, Elliot Ness and his team interviewed Dr. Sweeney in a suite at the Cleveland Hotel. The doctor agreed to cooperate and consented to a polygraph test. Because he was drunk at the time, 
Detectives gave him three days to sober up before they would begin the interrogation. They wanted to conduct this by the book so that the doctor could not escape any future charges based on technicalities. When the formal interrogation began, Ness was frustrated to hear Dr. Sweeney make a mockery of the whole thing. He was cracking jokes and giving vague answers. He sat through two hours of this before Dr. Sweeney was ready to take his polygraph. Detectives asked if he knew Edward Andresi. They asked if he killed him. They repeated the questions with Florence Polio. After looking over his answers, Ness felt certain Dr. Sweeney was the mad butcher. Ness confronted Dr. Sweeney, accusing him of being the killer. Dr. Sweeney narrowed his eyes and hissed, Then prove it. Ness recounted to his wife that he had never felt more threatened than he did in that moment. Despite the polygraph, Ness knew they had no evidence tying Dr. Sweeney to the crime. They had to let him go. Two days after the interrogation, Dr. Sweeney checked himself into a hospital in Sandusky. He would live out the rest of his days in one hospital or another. He was never officially charged with the murders. Ness thought the key to the investigation lied in focusing on the three victims that police had been able to identify, Edward Andresi, Florence Polio, and Rose Wallace. Lawrence Lyons, a private detective hired by the county sheriff's department, followed this line of investigation. Every few weeks, he would report his findings to Chief Deputy Gillespie. Eventually, he brought Deputy Gillespie a name, Frank Dullazal. Frank was a 52-year-old immigrant who lived and worked in the Kingsbury Run area. Residents knew him as an antisocial man who would carry knives and often threaten people with them. Frank had also once worked at a slaughterhouse. Lastly, witnesses saw Frank and Florence together a few weeks before her disappearance. Chief Deputy Gillespie liked what he heard, but he needed proof. When he found out that Frank had lived in an apartment a half block away from where the first piece of Florence's body had been found, he searched that apartment. Detective Lyons found some dark stains in the cracks of the bathroom floor. Tests determined the stains were blood. Detectives also spoke with Frank's neighbors and learned that Florence had lived with Frank for a time. He had also been seen in the company of Rose Wallace. Chief Deputy Gillespie was now certain they had their man. On July 5, 1939, the Sheriff's Department erected Frank Dolezal. They searched his current apartment and found 25 butcher knives. Two of them looked to have blood stains. However, there was nothing concrete tying Frank to the murders. Chief Deputy Gillespie would need a confession. Three detectives took turns and spent hours trying to get a confession from Frank. The breakthrough came the next afternoon when Sheriff O'Donnell proclaimed, Boys, we have a signed confession to one of the torso murders. Frank confessed to the murder of Florence Polio after hours of interrogation. He claimed that he hit her with his fist and she fell and hit her head on the bathtub. He then took a knife and cut her body up. He then dumped her body and burned her clothes. After obtaining his confession, Sheriff O'Donnell led reporters into an adjoining room where they could get a good look at the man they thought was the Mad Butcher. Frank's eyes were wide and glassy as he stared at the journalist taking his picture. They had no doubt that police finally caught the psychopath who had terrorized Cleveland for three years. Upon closer examination, there were clear problems with Frank's story. Frank had claimed to kill Florence on Saturday night, while the coroner said she was killed on Friday night. When informed of the discrepancy, Frank changed his story. Frank's original confession claimed that he dumped some of Florence's body parts in the alley behind his apartment. But that's not where any of Florence's body was found. 
When listening to his recorded voice, police detectives noticed that Frank often rambled and spoke disjointedly. This was further proof that the deputies coerced Frank's confession. Despite the discrepancies, Sheriff O'Donnell was adamant that they had the right man and only needed to talk to Frank again to, quote, straighten out some minor details. While incarcerated, Frank would recant his confession, saying he was beaten and tortured until he signed. Frank Dolezal spent five years in jail waiting for his day in court. Deputies separated Frank from the other inmates after two failed suicide attempts. On August 24th, Deputy Sheriff Hugh Crawford found Frank's body hanging in his cell. He and another officer cut him down and rushed him to emergency care, but their efforts were fruitless. Frank DeLazal was dead. Coroner Gerber examined Frank's body. The cause of death was asphyxiation. He estimated Frank must have hung there for 12 to 15 minutes, which sharply contrasted the Sheriff Department's claims that Frank was left alone no longer than three minutes. Coroner Gerber also found that Frank had six fractured ribs that were one to two months old. This gave credence to Frank's claims that he was beaten before he confessed. The Sheriff's Department denied ever striking Frank though they admitted he may have been sleep-deprived when he wrote his confession. There was an inquest, but it amounted to nothing. Clevelanders thought the arrest of Frank Delazal meant a terrifying mystery had been solved. But after his death, they were left with more questions and serious doubts that Frank had anything to do with the Cleveland Torso murders. To this day, the Cleveland Torso murders have never been solved. Most of the victims have never been identified, and the killings just stopped after the discovery of victims 11 and 12. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFCPod, Facebook.com slash TCFCPodcast. You can also find us on Instagram at TCFC underscore podcast. And of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, TCFCPod at gmail.com. Music for the show was provided by We Talk of Dreams, who created custom music just for us. Check them out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. This episode was researched and written by me, Brittany Martinez. Audio engineering was provided by Chase Gray, who manages Chase Gray Music. Content warning at the top of the show was provided by Tyler Allen, host of the Minds of Madness podcast. We would like to welcome to the club our most recent Patreon supporters. Thanks to Bobby, Mark C., Anna, host of the Truest of Crimes podcast, and Lucky Jean, 